Hi, I'm back again, just like I said I would be. And we are back to Incomparable, the explorations in the character of God. And this starts with King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. On his robe and on his thigh he has written a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's Revelation 19, verses 11 and 16. Let me tell you about the most humiliating moment of my adult life. <clears throat> I used to work in London for a firm of strategy consultants, most of whom were high-powered people who worked extremely hard and got paid a lot of money. One evening I was working late and rang my friend Tom from upstairs to see if he wanted to take a break outside. He did, so I walked toward the stairs to go to go down when suddenly an idea hit me. By hiding in the elevator alcove in the stairwell, I could leap out and scare the living daylights out of Tom when he walked past me. No one else was around and he would be coming down any minute. Sure enough, within seconds, I heard the third floor door swing open and footsteps coming down the stairs. I waited until he was within about a yard of my hiding place and then jumped out with a massive shout, causing him to find, fly backward into the wall, yelling with fright. It was only then that I realized it wasn't Tom. Tom had taken the elevator. It was a principal of the firm, a very senior man with a six-figure salary and the right to fire me. I received a severe reprimand, as you would expect, and never worked with him again. Those moments when you suddenly realize who somebody is can be devastating. Drama is built on it. King Oedipus and his mother... King Lear and his daughter, King Richard and the Sheriff of Nottingham, and King Kong and the nameless person who accidentally steps on his foot. The more powerful the person, the worse it is to find out that you have not been treating him or her with proper respect. So it is not surprising that the most devastating moment of them all will be when the King of Kings and Lords of Lords is shown for who he is, in, he is. The biblical word for this is revelation. The Greek word has the sense of unveiling, disclosure, even denouement. That a moment in the story when you finally realize who someone is and what it means. No earthly stories can prepare us for what this will be like because King Richard and King Kong are laughable in comparison to King Jesus. But there are a number of times in Scripture when Yahweh is suddenly seen to be the God of gods, and the Bible suggests that the return of Jesus will be something like these. The Philistines see it in 1 Samuel, verse 5, 1 Samuel 5. They capture the Ark of Yahweh, but then they make the mistake of putting it next to their god, Dagon. This is a chronic mismatch, the equivalent of that scene in Jurassic Park when they put the goat in the Tyrannosaurus paddock. Next morning, they find the dragon face down before the Ark of Yahweh. Their response is comic. So they took Dagon back and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of Yahweh. And the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. 1 Samuel 5 verses 3 to 4. And thus begins the original hot potato story. As the Philistines send the ark to Gath, then Ekron, 
with destruct, destruction coming, coming upon them wherever it goes. Eventually they realize they are doing, dealing with the God of gods, and in fear they hurriedly send it back to Israel. The Baal worshippers see it in 1 Kings 18. When challenged by Elijah to decide who is the true God, Yahweh or Baal, the Israelites say nothing. So the prophet devises a challenge. Whoever sends down fire from heaven to consume their sacrifice, he is the true God. Baal, of course, manages nothing in several hours. But Yahweh utterly consumes the offering, the soaking wet wood, the dust, even the stones. 1 Kings 18, verse 38. Like burglars who discovered they'd have robbed the mafia chieftain's home by mistake, the Israelites suddenly appreciate who they have got, who they have got on the wrong side of, and fall face down in terror and worship, crying, Yahweh is God. We could go on. Pharaoh, Og, Goliath, Ahab, Sennacherib, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Herod. Scripture describes numerous times when pagans, often too late, real realize they are not just up against any god, but the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The revelation of Jesus, though, will be more dramatic even than these. You see, that list of pagans knew that they were opposing a god of some sort, even if they didn't realize how powerful he was. Their theology, as confused as it was, at least led them to believe that if God stood against them, they were in trouble. But when Jesus is revealed, it will be a shock to almost everyone. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 2 to 5. People will be expecting a teacher with eyes of blue and the voice of a soothing brook, not a ruler with eyes of fire and the voice of a raging torrent. They will be proclaiming peace and security and be met with one who judges and makes war. The Jesus they are flippant about, humbly riding a donkey, will be replaced with one they are frightened about, triumphantly riding a white horse and instead of a mellow hippie who turns a blind eye to any wrongdoing, they will encounter a sovereign king with a passion for righteousness and a desire to vindicate those who have suffered and been martyred for his name, otherwise known as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All hail King Jesus! Next one is Son of God and Son of Man. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. Matthew 26, verses 63 to 65. Jesus said he was both the Son of God and the Son of Man, and he is. I don't know about you, but I spent a lot of my life confused as to exactly what that means. I always assumed he was basically stating what the creed said about him. To me, calling himself Son of God meant that he was the second person of the Trinity, and calling himself Son of Man meant that he was as human as you or me. So in the trial before the Sanhedrin that we have just read about, I thought Jesus was saying that he was fully God and fully man. But then I discovered some things that made me reconsider. I found that in the Old Testament, which Jesus knew extremely well, Israel was called God's firstborn son. Exodus 4, 22 and 23, 
in Jeremiah 31, verse 20. And so was the king, 2 Samuel 7, verse 14, and Psalms 89, verse 26. But that this in no way suggested Israel or the king were divine. I found that another Jewish sect from a similar period used the phrase Son of God to refer to the Messiah, not a defined figure. I also found that often in the Gospels, Son of God and Christ were used together, like they are in this scene, as, as if they were saying virtually the same thing. Gradually, it became clear that when Matthew, Mark, and Luke talked about the Son of God. It had more to do with being the promised Messiah of Israel than it did with being God incarnate. There are a lot of reasons to believe that Jesus saw himself as God, not least the way he talked about his relationship with his Father using incredibly intimate language like Abba, Papa, and saying things like, I and the Father are one. But the title Son of God is in itself, in itself is not one of them. At the same time, though, I realized that Son of Man did not simply mean that Jesus was human. Although it could mean only that, it seemed to mean much more when Jesus used it of himself. In Daniel 7, 13, we read about someone, quote, like a Son of Man, end quote, approaching the end days. That is, God, with the clouds of heaven, sharing his throne, glory, and kingdom. I then noticed that when Jesus talked about himself as the Son of Man, he often made reference to this passage, suggesting that he thought himself, about himself as that someone, the one who would approach God and share his dominion over all things. Quote, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. End quote. That's Matthew 16, verses 27 and 28. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Luke seventeen twenty four. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Matthew twenty five, thirty one. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Mark thirteen, verse twenty six. So in the Gospels, Son of God was used to mean the Christ, but Son of Man to mean the almost divine figure in Daniel seven, who shares the authority of the Ancient of Days. I realized I had got things upside down. It now looked as if calling himself the Son of Man was an even bigger claim, and certainly not a smaller one, than calling himself the Son of God. If anything, Son of God showed he was a man, as the promised King of Israel, and the Son of Man suggested he might be God. The clincher is the trial scene in Matthew 26 when the high priest has asked Jesus if, if he was the Son of God. From what we know about the high priest, this was almost certainly about being the Christ. Devout Jews were very unlikely to be asking a Jewish prophet and would be Messiah, whether he was the second person of the Trinity. Jesus then answers that he is on the high priest's own testimony. The phrase has the sense of, you said it. But that soon they will see, but that soon they will all see the Son of Man at the right hand of God and coming on the clouds of heaven. Quite apart from being yet another reference to Daniel 7, just think about this reply for a minute. It doesn't sound as if Jesus is downgrading, does it? It doesn't sound like they are asking him if asking if he is fully God, and he is saying, yes, but I am also fully man. It sounds like he is upgrading dramatically. 
It sounds like the schoolboy who has just been secretly cast as the lead part in a Hollywood blockbuster. When the bullies asked him, Did you come top of the class in drama? He replies, Oh, you said it. But from now on you will see me as Harry Potter on billboards and film screens all over the country. The high priest realizes the scandal of this claim, tears his robes, and announces that Jesus has committed blasphemy. Like Stephen a few months later, Jesus was condemned for blasphemy, but not for referring to the Son of God, but the Son of Man. Let me read that last sentence again. Like Stephen a few months later, Jesus was condemned for his blasphemy, not for referring to the Son of God, but the Son of Man. You can see why, for someone to claim that he was the promised King of Israel was bad enough. But to say he was also the one who would share the throne with God himself and establish an everlasting kingdom was an outrage. But it was true, far more true than the priest realized. Within a few years, those priests had died and gone, but the Son of God and Son of Man was seated at the right hand of the Ancient of Days, and to him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him, his dominion in an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7, verse 14. Whew. The Lord is the Spirit. Yet to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That is Second Corinthians 3, verses 15 to 17. The F Holy Spirit is fully God. Nothing too controversial there. But while we may believe this, we don't often act like it in our worship and teaching and practice. On the contrary, we are extraordinarily vague about him. The vast majority of our songs and hymns don't mention him. The same is often true of our books and sermons, and much of what he does, filling and empowering people, inspiring prophecy, giving various gifts like tongues and interpretation and healing, has frequently been shot out of the Western Church. You cannot imagine any pagans in the period of the Acts, or in modern-day China for that matter, mistaking the Trinity for the Son, Father, Son, and Mary, as many Muslims do today. Nor would anyone who had met Paul be left wondering whether the Spirit's gifts were for every believer. The early church worshipped, he knew. The early church worshipped, knew, and experienced the Holy Spirit as fully God. In large part, this was a theological belief about the nature of God. People listened to Jesus, reflected on the scriptures, and saw that God was three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the Spirit, same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are, are varieties of activities, but the same God, who empowers them all in everyone. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 6. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 2 Corinthians 13. Verse 14. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus, 
and for sprinkling with his blood. 1 Peter 1 verse 2 Now, within this understanding of the Holy Spirit as God, Paul's phrase, Now the Lord is the Spirit, is very important. What does it mean? Oh, it could mean Yahweh is the Spirit, because the word for Lord is the word that translates Yahweh in the Old Testament. Or it could mean Jesus is the Spirit, because Paul usually means Jesus when he talks about the Lord. The context, though, makes it likely that it means the first of these, not the second. Paul had been making a long comparison between the glory of the new covenant and the old. In these verses, he is saying that, just as Moses removed the physical veil from his face when he turned toward Yahweh in the tent of meeting, so believers today have their spiritual veil removed when they turn toward Yahweh in faith. Do you see? The analogy from Exodus, which he had been developing since verse 7, wouldn't work unless Paul was using the word Lord to mean Yahweh. Furthermore, it is very unlikely that Paul, who sees the work of Jesus and the Spirit as clearly different, would teach that Jesus and the Spirit were, were the same. It is therefore very likely that he means now Yahweh is the Spirit, or even now the Spirit is Yahweh. This conviction that the Spirit is fully God is how Paul could say that to be lived in by the Spirit was to be God's temple. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 It is also, incidentally, how Peter could say that to lie to the Spirit was to lie to God. Acts 5 verses 1 to 10 The Spirit is God. For Paul, the divine Holy Spirit was a theological conviction. But he was not just that. He was also an experienced reality. And you can see why. Imagine you were a first century Jew who had read and studied your Old Testament and had seen Yahweh reveal himself through the Spirit, the glory cloud, the law, the word and wisdom. Imagine you had seen the word and wisdom perfectly embodied in the man Jesus of Nazareth who had since been raised from the dead. Now, imagine it dawning on you that the spirit of power and prophecy, the glory cloud, with its dynamic manifestations of God's presence, and the law, with its revelation of how to live a life pleasing to God, had been perfectly brought together in the Holy Spirit and that he was living in each and every believer. Would you not be eager and enthusiastic, even expectant, that he would bring to your life the power, the prophecy, and the presence of God, and the revelation of how to please him that you had been waiting for? Would you not, in fact, anticipate the Spirit to work miracles among you, being bring regular prophetic revelation, cause the dynamic presence of God to be felt, and teach you how to live a holy life on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, this, if you read Romans 1 and 2, Romans 1 and 2, Corinthians, Ephesians, and Colossians, is exactly what Paul expected and exactly what he experienced. It was also, if you read Acts, exactly what pretty much everyone else experienced. If we see the Spirit as being present to inspire the Bible and not much else, then of course we will not worship, teach, and experience Him as fully, godlike. I read that wrong. If we see the Spirit as being present to inspire the Bible and not much else, then, of course, we will not worship, teach, and experience him as fully as God like the early church did. But if we see him as the spirit of promise, the power of God, 
the fulfillment of scriptures like Ezekiel 36 and Joel 2 and Jeremiah 31 and Isaiah 61, we will expect and experience the indwelling guidance, baptism, and filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Don't let us stop at theology. Let us continue into worshiping and experiencing the Lord, who is the Spirit. Selah. Huh. Read and reflect. If you're not careful, it is easy to get fuzzy about the Holy Spirit. Read carefully through the following four passages, which are probably the clearest explanation of what the age of the Spirit would look like in the entire Old Testament, and identify what sort of things the Holy Spirit does among his people. Then ask God to fill you again with his Spirit, Ephesians 5.18, and expect these sort of things to happen in your life. The Spirit of Yahweh God is upon me, because Yahweh has appointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of Yahweh's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, and to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh, that he may be glorified. That's Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 3. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers, on the day when I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares Yahweh. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know Yahweh, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That's Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Therefore, Say to the house of Israel, Thus says Yahweh God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them and the nations will know that I am Yahweh, declares Yahweh God, when though you, through you, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clear water, clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Ezekiel 36 verses 22 to 27. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. 
Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as Yahweh has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom Yahweh calls. That was from Joel 2, 28 to 32. And I'll do one more. The Helper. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. That's John 16, verse 7. Some words have meanings so rich they cannot be properly translated. The Hawaiian word aloha means hello, goodbye, welcome, and love all at once. The Hebrew shalom could be interpreted as peace, greetings, farewell, or blessing. Sometimes translating such a word can lose so much of its meaning that it's better not to, or at least to list all of its possible meanings when you do. A classic example is the word Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit, parakletos. There are almost as many translations of this word as there are Bible versions. I have come across helper, advocate, Counselor, Comforter, Encourager, and Friend. And some don't even translate it at all, leaving it as Paraclete. Of course, the word is richer than can be brought across in any one translation, and it has nuances of all of these. For the moment, we are going to stick with Helper, remembering that the word is really far deeper than that. Whichever name we use, however, it should be very clear that the Spirit is a person. The church has often dropped the ball on this one. I'm always amazed and concerned by the number of people I know who refer to the Holy Spirit as an it rather than a he. Perhaps this is because of the impersonal picture scriptures uses like wind and breath and fire. Perhaps it is because we all know what, that fathers and sons are people, but the word spirit is a little bit vague in our normal usage. Whatever the reason, the truth remains that the Holy Spirit is most clearly a person who teaches, John fourteen twenty six, has opinions, Acts fifteen twenty eight, distributes gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, intercedes, Romans 8, 26 and 27, and can be grieved, Ephesians 4, 30. If instead of calling him the Holy Spirit, we called him the friend or the comforter, there would be no doubt about his personhood. He is not just a person, though, but someone who gets so close to us that it beggars belief following his activity through that marvelous chapter, Romans 8. As helper, the Spirit sets us free, helps us set our minds on the things of God, and brings life to us, chapter 8, verses 2 to 11. As counselor, he is the one who knows all things, advises us on how to make ordinary decisions, leading us according to his will, which proves that we are sons of God. Chapter 8, verse 12 to 14. As comforter, the Holy Spirit comes alongside us in our trouble, reminds us that we are children of God, and helps us see that 
the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Chapter 8, verses 15 to 18. As advocate, he helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Chapter 8, verse 26. These are activities of a person, but not just any person. They are the activity of Yahweh himself by his holy and life-giving spirit. We get a glimpse in all of this of why on earth Jesus said, It is for your good that I go away. Of course it's for our good. Jesus taught the truth incessantly, but was still confronted by disciples who didn't understand him at all and could not bear the teaching he would give. The Spirit, by living within them, guided them into all the truth. Jesus preached a gospel of repentance, but ended up rejected by the world. The Spirit convicted the world in regard to righteousness. Jesus was constrained by a physical body that meant he could only be in one place at once. The Spirit was able to empower witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utmost ends of the earth, and he still does. Were Jesus the man still walking the earth, I, would, I could expect to get one billionth of his time, and he would show up in my church about once every 20,000 years. The Helper, by contrast, lives in me 24 hours a day, helps me in my weaknesses, prays for me, reveals truth, truth to me, and comes with, with me to every church service and car service I ever go to. This is why Pentecost was such a big deal. God's, whose house had always been made of cloth or stone, was taking up residence in people, and this showed he had forgiven their sins. The prophets had looked forward to a time when God's Spirit would be poured out on people as a sign of his forgiveness, and the apostles could see it happening in front of them. The prophets predicted that the Spirit would be given to all types of people as a sign that they too had been accepted into the people of God. The apostles realized that this is exactly what had just happened. The Spirit of God was truly coming to dwell in people, and this in itself was a guarantee that those people would have an eternal inheritance. Yahweh had kept his covenant, left the temple, upped sticks, and moved into people. So history changed. With that decision, to ascend into heaven and send the Helper in his place, Jesus set in motion an incredible plan to see people from all sorts of different nations and languages born again, made holy and united together. And the agent of this plan was, as it only could ever have been, the most gloriously effective, effective helper, advocate, counselor, comforter, encourager, and friend that the world has ever seen. The Holy Spirit of God. Oh. Well, I'm going to stop now and go talk to my friend. I'll be back. Thank you. I hope you're enjoying these recordings.